Now, I think the authors pointed out the, uh, the need for quality is a really overarching thing, theme. It's one component, but it also overarches uh, everything. So we are going to talk about quality assurance in post-secondary education in the U.S. And uh, uh, we'll ask some questions. And uh, let me introduce the panel first very quickly, again, looking at your bios. So we have Ajay Box, Chancellor of Kentucky Community College, uh, Community and Technical College System. Kay Gilcher, Director of the Accreditation Group at the Office of Post-Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education. Andrew Kelly, the Director of the Center on Higher, the Center on Higher Education Reform at the American Enterprise Institute. And Iris Palmer, Senior Policy Analyst at the Education Division um, at the National Governors, Governors Association. So before we sort of get into lengthy questions, just to sort of break things up a little bit, um, quality assurance in the, the U.S. secondary, uh, post-secondary system, the first three words that come to mind. No more, no less. Three words. Uh, Kay, do you want to start? Okay. I'll say first, uh, challenged. Second, fractured. And third, this is one word, poorly understood. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Iris. A black box. Okay. Uh, Andrew. Uh, simultaneously rigid and flimsy. <laughs> I feel like that's four, <laughs> but that's fine. No. Oh, and doesn't count. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, Jay. Uh, less than needed. Okay. Well, so and we're going to have a whole conversation about this, but I think that's a pretty clear signal of where things are, uh, where at least the panel thinks things are. Uh, so. This seems to jive with one of the findings of the report, and the, one of the findings of the report is that in order to fix this, we need to fund, um, that we need to link the funding to outcomes. I think you just said that other countries are much more demanding about accountability, especially when there are public funds provided. We, um, and what's interesting about the report, and that I'm appreciative of, is even though in the title it talks about career technical education, in this country we have all these different funding streams, and one is a particular funding stream for career technical education, but it's actually very, very small percentage of, I think, what the federal dollars, at least, that go to what we consider education and career and technical education, sort of the big ones are uh, student loans and Pell Grants, over $150 billion a year, and so, and which is all part of the, as they refer to, the Title IV programs. So I appreciate the fact that you called those out. I mean, that's where the money is. So, um, and again, it sort of gets to this idea that we're talking about this false dichotomy between sort of money that's in the higher education pot and money that's in the career pot. And no, in fact, all of these systems need to be talking to one another, and let's use the big levers that we have. And uh, Title IV dollars, federal financial aid dollars, are a big lever. So, um, so with that in mind, let's sort of jump right into this. So the report spent a lot of time talking about um, the, the role of the federal government and accreditation in the quality assurance process. So Kay is our resident expert here. Um, could you just sort of briefly talk uh, through sort of what this triad is and to sort of describe the federal role for us because it's still confusing to me and it would be helpful to hear. Okay, well as Simon said, we have an extremely decentralized system and that leads also to uh, decentralization in terms of responsibility for higher education quality assurance. Uh, the triad is the, the Department of Education, the states, and uh, accrediting agencies. And many years ago, uh, when we had concern about the provision of uh, dollars from the federal government to support students in their educational endeavors, we made use of an existing system, uh, the accreditation system that had been in place since the 1880s in some cases, in order to take care of the main uh, part of the quality assurance challenge. But also in uh, existing are all of the states, and many of those states have very robust uh, oversight, particularly at the career and technical education level, of the quality of the provision uh, to their students. Uh, the Department of Education primarily has uh, the role of oversight of accrediting agencies. That is, we recognize certain accrediting agencies as gatekeepers to federal funding. Uh, we also have oversight of all of the administration of the monies that go out of our Title IV student financial assistance program. So there are concerns about, uh, you know, the financial stability of an institution, the ability of the institution to 
uh, actually administered those funds responsibly. So we try to, uh, ideally, this triad would be one where there's a lot of communication um, across and among the players. Uh, this has been particularly challenging because the states are not a single entity each. So uh, within each state there are varieties of entities that are responsible for different parts of the educational system. And uh, you may have heard something about the state authorization uh, challenges. That plays into it as well. We have tried to specify what it means to be authorizing uh, an institution to offer post-secondary education, and we find, of course, that there are great differences in the states. So that being said, um, the accreditation system is a voluntary system, except that it isn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, as I mentioned, in order to have uh, institutions eligible to participate in the Title IV programs, they have to be accredited by a recognized accreditor. So our, uh, our role in the federal government is to uh, take what the Congress has given us in terms of the statute of what's required for recognition to elaborate that in regulations and then to apply those regulations in our re review of accrediting agencies to see whether or not they meet the requirements. The uh, statute has in it uh, ten required standards. Leading in those is the standard on student achievement. The standard says that uh, we have to look at, uh, there has to be a standard of student achievement and as appropriate it should include measures of completion, uh, placement, and licensure passage rates. As appropriate is certainly true for CTE programs and when we are reviewing the entities that accredit CTE programs we do uh, ensure that they are looking at those measures and that they have established some uh, thresholds, benchmarks uh, in those particular areas. We are, however, forbidden from regulating on those required standards areas. So there is very wide variation among the types of agencies that accredit uh, CTE and other programs on how prescriptive those standards are. And there's a rationale for that if you think about how a very large uh, research one institution and the kinds of programs and, uh, that are offered there, um, maybe anywhere from uh, you know, a four-year program to graduate uh, programs, or even a uh, comprehensive uh, institution which has uh, at the associate level as well as a baccalaureate level. So, uh, and there's a very strong, um, resistance in the higher education community for the federal government to be doing anything uh, very prescriptive in the areas of quality assurance. That being said, there is a lot of pressure that's coming from a lot of uh, sides in the uh, current discussion and debate on accountability and transparency. In CTE, it's particularly complicated because there are varieties of types of agencies that accredit CTE programs. I don't know if you're aware that we also recognize some state agencies for the approval of CTE programs uh, in an accrediting agency role. So there are four state agencies that we recognize, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, the New York State Board of Regents, and Oklahoma. Uh, in the past, there were a number of others, but the uh, difficulty of sort of taking the state registration and oversight role and then trying to add in what was required in an accreditation role became particularly challenging for a number of states, and so they dropped out. Those are gatekeepers to Title IV funds, so those institutions are not otherwise accredited except by the state agencies. We also have regional accrediting agencies, uh, mainly for degree granting institutions, and a lot of the community college based uh, CTE provision is under the accreditation of those uh, entities. The, uh, there are also uh, regional accrediting agencies focused on CTE offered primarily through K-12 uh, schools. Uh, this has been a real culture conflict in that the uh, K-12 kind of uh, oversight and accreditation is very much on a school improvement model. And our requirements in terms of recognition of accrediting agencies is much more compliance oriented. 
And we have had actually recently four of those uh, commissions of regional accrediting agencies uh, no longer uh, being recognized by the Department of Education because of that kind of conflict. There are also national accrediting agencies uh, that focus and have historically focused on career and technical education. These are pri primarily uh, accrediting for-profit providers. And uh, they have been relatively good at uh, setting very clear benchmarks and looking very closely at each program at the institutions that they accredit. Uh, I won't say uniformly good at do that, but there is uh, certainly a lot of uh, practice in those areas to doing that. Um, I think that uh, the one other thing I'd like to say is that you probably know about our gainful employment regulations, uh, which did reach a little bit of an impasse uh, with the court um, intervening. We are, of course, rising up and trying to do those again, and we will be uh, negotiating uh, new gainful employment regulations. We do believe that those are a very significant way to try to identify the uh, successful programs and those programs that are failing to meet the needs of students. Great. Uh, thank you, Kay. So, Andrew, uh, one of the primary recommendations which other folks have talked about is tying federal financial aid to outcomes. Um, do we need to do this? Uh, what outcomes matter? Should we do it? How could we do it? Sure. Tell us and let us. Wow. Uh, well, should we do it? <laughs> no pressure, um, but take notes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot of questions. I mean, so uh, first I want to say thanks to the OECD folks, the researchers for doing this. Um, uh, you're, you're the latest in a long line of people to critique the quality assurance uh, system in the United States for higher education more generally, but also for CTE. Um, maybe some international prodding will, will uh, drive, drive the change we've been talking about since the early 70s. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, you know, the, the, the question about regulating on the basis of outcomes and sort of uh, 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 um, basing decisions about who has access to Title IV and outcomes is something that is intuitively very appealing. I think it's, it's we, we, we've heard a lot about how complicated CTE is and how complicated the measurement of the outcomes of CTE uh, are. But I actually think it's much simpler in many ways than, than the fight about the degree granting for uh, four-year colleges in that, in that there's a legitimate uh, argument at that level um, uh, that, that folks are there not necessarily just for job training, right? They're there to, to become enlightened citizens, to go do a mission somewhere uh, abroad. Um, whereas in CT, it's pretty clear why you're there. You're there to get a job. Um, uh, and what, what's striking to me is how uh, if you look at um, Title IV, eligibility versus uh, uh, the way we do, we, the way we evaluate, say, WIA, right? WIA, you actually do have to pr make your, your employment outcomes public, right? And states have to post them publicly and say, this is how we're spending our WIA dollars, this is how we've placed people into jobs and so on. Title IV, we don't really, we don't really expect much of that um, uh, on, the part of, on the part of providers. Um, so I think, I think the, the, the logic of basing uh, uh, quality assurance on outcomes is a great idea. Uh, I, would, I would posit, though, that what we need is not, we need to get away from binary outcomes, which is what we have now. We have binary outcomes for both state authorization and for accreditation, right? So what, does, what happens when you have a binary outcome? Well, it becomes incredibly high stakes, right? And you see, you see what's happening in, in San Francisco with Community College of San Francisco, right? They're, they are threatened with losing their accreditation. It looks like they will lose their accreditation pending an appeal. Um, what happens is if you just have a zero one variable, you either have it or you don't, it sets this stage for uh, uh, these high stakes decisions. It's also massively uninformative uh, to, to students. I mean, one of the things that appealed to me about, about the, the, the talk from the folks from OECD was um, the notion of posting posting program reviews and process audits online or, or in public so that folks can see what's actually happening in these programs. Um, accreditation reviews aren't even made public oftentimes, right? It's just, a, it's sort of a private kind of uh, uh, almost collusive deal. So, um, so what, I, what I would suggest is uh, certainly focus on outcomes for quality assurance, but also don't, don't lose sight of the fact that we need to move away from a binary system of eligibility. Um, for these programs. There should be sliding scale for eligibility. If you don't perform well, um, we should slowly ratchet down your eligibility for aid, I think, is the way I would do it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, 
So Iris, uh, working with NGA, working with governors, so we're talking about the triad, we're talking about the federal, uh, and you have a lot of experience with states. So what is the role of states? What should it be in ensuring quality and post-secondary education? Are they doing this? I mean, Kay said some states are doing it really well. Uh, are they doing it by and large? And what are some good examples we can learn from? So I think um, Kay had a very good point, which is that um, state authorization is very inconsistent across states, how they actually implement it. Um, it's also, by and large, focused on consumer protection, which is really important, but doesn't necessarily get to the heart of quality. Um, and most states are pretty happy as far as the quality of education to leave it up to the traditional arbiters of quality, the institutions and the faculty. And that is how higher education has been judged as quality throughout the history of the United States. Um, but some states are really trying to get more of a handle on quality. And sort of the push for this is that they are putting more of their funding through outcomes measures. And I think the, the worry is, is that if you don't hold quality constant and you don't ensure that quality is constant, it may decline as you tie funding to it. Um, so states are looking at outcomes and quality in two ways. And I'm kind of going to go put state authorization and the compact for state authorization aside for a moment. Um, they're looking at uh, measuring learning outcomes through standardized assessments, and they're looking at connecting labor market outcomes to, um, to programs, particular programs. And in those, some of them are just doing the public reporting piece, and some of them are actually connecting it to their accountability <coughs> systems and their funding systems. So if we start with uh, measuring learning, mark learning outcomes, um, Kentucky is actually doing this for their four-year schools. They are um, posting online the, certain, the, um, the assessments that their students are, 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 are coming up with. And Nevada is doing the same thing. There are several other states. Um, then, for instance, Tennessee actually has this as a piece of their performance funding formula for their two-year schools. And in South Dakota, students actually have to get a certain score on a standardized assessment to leave the general education core. So those are some states that are using it in part of their accountability systems for students and for the institutions. Um, for labor market outcomes, posting it online, I think we've all heard of college measures. And there are states, Arkansas, Nevada, Texas, Colorado, who are putting labor market outcomes online in a way that students and families can actually see what the outcomes are for their, uh, for their programs and hopefully use those in making decisions for which programs to go into, hopefully. I mean, we don't want to misuse our labor market data. I'll put that caveat out there. Um, but some states are also using it as accountability in their funding formulas. So um, the Texas State um, Technical College System is allocating a large amount of their funding um, based on their labor market outcomes for their programs. Um, the Wisconsin Technical System is looking at doing the same thing. And um, Missouri is looking at the placement of recent graduates as part as a one option in their performance funding formula as well. OK, and to the last piece of the triad, although not representing a creditor, but a creditor should represent institutions. Uh, Jay, what can institutions do to respond to the ever-changing skills uh, that are needed by industry? It's constantly churning. Um, how can industry and institutions work together to increase both the value and demand for the credentials that colleges are delivering? Thank you. Uh, you know, the traditional way that we've always uh, dealt with the changing skills needed in, in industry is to have advisory boards that work with our programs and give us feedback, and then we make changes to curriculum and move forward. Uh, that's partially effective, but the, the reality is those, uh, those advisory boards meet maybe once a year. By the time the feedback gets rolled into a curriculum change, then it's two or three years down the road and we're not as responsive as, as we need to be. So we, in Kentucky, we've started turning more in, in, uh, to technology and current reporting that kind of helps us understand what we need to be doing on a just continuous basis. For example, we've always used uh, labor market information to track employment needs uh, in, in certain uh, careers, and that helps us uh, make determinations of, of when to ramp up a certain program and when to scale back. Uh, but, but even LMI information can have a delay time. We've recently started using a, um, a more real-time LMI, 
which has been very, very helpful. But the most... Sorry, do you uh, folks know what LMI is? Labor okay. market information. Yep. Yes. Uh, the, the most r uh, recent thing that we've done has been very helpful is that our entire state, uh, through our workforce investment boards and uh, our, our workforce development area, plus our colleges, our community colleges, have bought into a software called Burning Glass. Now, I'm not just promoting the software. I'm, I'm talking about the tool that it's provided, which uh, takes uh, the job openings that are posted out there by industry, uh, which requires skill sets that are required for that job opening, and they post that, and we match it back up to the actual uh, programs, credentials that we're offering. And uh, it's been very telling for us uh, because we're able to see what real time, what the job opening is, and say, see where we have matched up the skills that we need and if they're missing. Uh, for example, what we found just recently, uh, we did a uh, look at uh, our registered nurse, our ADN program across the state, and we saw an anomaly that we hadn't seen before, and that was in certain parts of the state all of a sudden the hospitals and the other health care providers were requiring Spanish of all of the nurses that they were hiring. That was not in our curriculum. It was not. And, and we said, oh gosh, we're missing something here. So it opened up two opportunities for us. It opened up the opportunity for us to immediately change that as a requirement for our, our degree, but it also opened up the opportunity for our workforce training division to start going out to those health care providers and saying we can come in quickly and train your current uh, nursing staff and bring them up to speed in, in nursing. That's the kind of immediate feedback we need to be able to be responsive to the industries. Great. Thanks. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about uh, recently, at least in this town, I guess, isn't that the name of the new book? <laughs> so this town on, uh, on quality and accreditation and the House just held a hearing a few weeks ago on accreditation and, you know, I, th I think there was really some sort of, uh, not even confusion, but just dumbfoundedness at really what some members of the committee sort of expressed as uh, disbelief that uh, this system, that you know, the accreditation system, which is this voluntary peer-based system, basically holds the keys to the Title IV kingdom and there are, you know, to these 150 plus billion dollars worth of financial aid and that we have no real guarantee on the other side of basic things like students graduating, getting jobs, getting jobs with, uh, you know, that allow them to pay back their loans, et cetera. So there's a lot of, in the ethos and in the, you know, in the air around uh, this accountability question. So I know we're, uh, we want to have time for questions, but just sort of quickly, sort of thinking about that and going forward, what do you think are the, are the biggest opportunities to improve quality uh, in U.S. higher education? What are the biggest challenges and obstacles right now? So. Um, who wants to start? Andrew, do you want to start? Ooh, sure. <laughs> I made the mistake of looking at you. You did. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so I think uh, I think one of the things that that the that the report highlights and that we don't pay enough attention to uh, here, particularly in quality assurance, is the programmatic accreditation versus institutional accreditation. And to me, and to me, CTE seems seems really well suited for programmatic accreditation that that potentially spans institutions. Um, uh, the institution-centric view of the world, that, that the entire accreditation system is built around that, I think that is sort of, uh, we're sort of moving past that, moving past an, an institution-centric view. Um, and so I think, I think that's an opportunity. I think thinking harder about programmatic uh, accreditation or, or programmatic certification as it relates to, um, to, to eligibility for various pots of federal money. Um, um, the biggest obstacle, frankly, is that this has been... Um, this is a game of kind of kicking, um, you know, handing the the hot potato off uh, from to, you know to one other. So so we decided to hand the the ball to accreditors, right, to ensure quality. And they said, well, that's not really our job. We're not gatekeepers. And they said, well, we'll do it anyway. And and then and accreditors say, we don't want to do this. And you know, we, we'd rather not be doing this. Uh, you know, in some cases. And 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 but everybody kind of holds their hands up like this and doesn't want to touch it either. Um, and then the last thing I would say is just, I think that the collaboration between um, employers and, and the higher ed system is a big area of frustration on both sides of the coin. I think employers feel also that it's not just that they're 
I think they're not, they don't feel like they have a very receptive audience often um, in the higher ed community. And I think that's a big problem. Okay. Well, I, I think there actually has been a little bit of uh, light emerging out of the higher ed community itself. Uh, there has been a, a drumbeat for many years on trying to better define uh, outcomes and uh, measure those outcomes. The resistance has been within um, higher ed institutions, I think, more than within accrediting agencies. And accrediting agencies have been trying to drive this for a number of years. I think that there is a real sense that the time is getting very short. And in fact, you might have seen this morning within the uh, Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle both had articles about yet another new uh, system for that uh, several institutions came together in trying to define what would be the measures that would be made public about their uh, performance as institutions. And there's a lot of thinking that's going along those lines. So it's still very slow, uh, but I think there has been a wake up call that's been heard. Paris. So I would actually say something that we didn't really talk about here, and that's um, the sort of rise of competency-based education to which you've been a party at the federal <laughs> level. Um, and I think that that actually has a huge possibility of certifying and demonstrating actual student learning and holding student learning constant rather than time constant is a would be a huge breakthrough in this. I think the challenge is what the challenge always is in, in demonstrating quality, and that is making sure you have valid assessments that actually say these students actually know what we need them to know. And um, I think that continues to be a struggle, and I think that it's gonna continue to be a struggle as um, states and the federal government uh, s struggle to change their policy structure in that way. Thank you, Iris. Uh, I stole but, your yeah, no, that, but uh, of course, Kentucky is, is highly involved in, in uh, the driving the competency-based learning uh, approach. And uh, uh, no offense, but accreditation is critical because we have to have the accreditation. But in career and technical education, the bottom line is: Are our graduates getting employed, and are they doing a good job in for the employer? Mm -hmm. And and so we have. A feedback system. Uh, our, our what drives us the most is are our, our graduates successful, and so we are turning much more attention to uh, how what are the certifications our graduates have, what how uh, how quickly do they pass licensures exams, how uh, quickly are they employed, and what is their average salary upon employment. Those are the kind of feedbacks we need to make critical decisions. The, the accrediting looks at things just, in, in my opinion, w way too broad and doesn't look at really the end results. And, and that's why I said that, that at my three words, uh, uh, less than enough for accreditation, I, I really think accreditation can get a little bit more directed into what we really need, and that is to look at the end results of our graduates. Great, thank you. And actually, uh, I want to open it up for questions until Claire tells me that we have to stop. Um, hold on, Sharon. <laughs> She's very excited. Uh, but I would, I would actually just, I love hearing your three words again. I would love to hear the other panelists' three words again, just so that I can write them down also. Mm. Okay, do you remember what yours were? Challenged, fractured, and poorly understood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Uh, mine was simultaneously rigid, and then if I use a symbol, like an ampersand, um, <laughs> uh, 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 flimsy. And, and can, if I could explain what I meant by that very yeah. quickly, We'd, we don't have very good quality control, but yet, it, but yet the system keeps a lot of people out. Right. So. Yeah. Do you remember what yours were? Yeah, um, a black box. So oh, I'm, yeah. I'm counting the article, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, we have some questions of, um, in the front. Yes, uh, the mic is coming. 
If you could identify yourself and where you're from so that we... Hi, my name is Sharon Boyvin. I'm from the National Center for Education Statistics in the U.S. Department of Education. And Jay was mentioning the difficulty in responding to employer needs because of the time that it takes to set up a new curriculum and get it approved and stuff. And we know that as a result, a lot of the occupational education in this country takes place through the non-credit system in community colleges. And yet, those non-credit programs are not subject to these kinds of policy levers that we have. You can't use federal aid for them. States don't count them because they don't fund them with the exception of a few like North Carolina. And there's virtually no data or outcome measures on non-credit. So what policy levers do we have to assure quality in that very large portion of the occupational education in the US? <laughs> a black box. Uh, wait. We, we've done two things in Kentucky. Uh, for, first of all, uh, we've modulized all, all of our credit curriculum and encourage in our uh, workforce training side that they apply a credit type of uh, curriculum in what they're using when it fits. Uh, and, and that allows then for, for employees who are getting training to be able to work toward the transcripted credential. Now, uh, the other side of it is is we've been doing that for several years, but we had never talked about the value of working with that employee employer to say, how can we transition that student toward a credential, to, toward some kind of certification down the road? So what our, for the last four years, we've been tracking how many of our students will actually transition from a workforce training initiative over into a credential seeking student and we've set uh, performance measures for our institutions to work with those uh, uh, employees to transition them in towards credentials and we've seen we're up to eight and a half percent our goal is ten percent by next year so we're making progress I think that's a really important question. Three three quick points about it. One is it I think it points out a lot of a lot of how we differ from other countries, especially is we, we don't count a lot of stuff that they do. That's partly what explains our our lagging behind, if you want to call it that. Uh, the second the second thing is um, uh, on the on the the one thing I would I would sort of push back on a little bit in the report is that it, it at times it feels like the quality assurance problem is only in the for-profit sector. Um, the for-profit sector has a lot of problems. We know, we know that. Um, I would suggest, though, that the point you started with, which is nimbleness to respond to labor market demand, that's one strength the for-profit sector brings to this, to this question in particular. Um, um, and, then, and then the third thing is just on the non-credit side versus credit side, one of the things that I think is interesting or, 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 or I'd be wary of is um, bringing those programs under Title IV eligibility and what that might do to the pricing of them. So, uh, yeah. um, I, just, I think there is an opportunity in terms of the competency-based uh, models. So that, you know, where you um, earn your knowledge or uh, achieve those skills is less important than your being able to demonstrate them. So I love, I love Kay for saying that. So, uh, so we agree here at New America Foundation, and we are actually we are embarking on a, a, a research project around non-credit, and would love to work with those of you in the audience who are interested in this issue. So, uh, so look for an event maybe next year on this topic. Uh, other questions? I'm sorry. In the yes. Sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Barry Stern with the Haberman Educational Foundation. Uh, most of the uh, OECD countries, or at least many of them, have what they call employment qualification frameworks. Uh, I think we mentioned Scotland as being one of them. Um, it's been very difficult to get anything like that going. We had the old NOIC and SOICs uh, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, but Kentucky is doing some interesting things in terms of sector-based uh, economic development, uh, trying to align the educational institutions, the colleges, schools, universities, and so forth, with the economic plans of different regions. Uh, then we have accreditation agencies. But the interesting thing about Euro the European and Asian employment qualifications frameworks is that they're really dominated by employers. They pretty much say, here's what you got to know and be able to do to get employed. Um, so try to help, help me out with this. How do you relate accreditation employment qualification frameworks and what Kentucky is doing in sector-based economic development.
And if folks who aren't from Kentucky also want to. <laughs> I guess the only thing I would say to that is the call out that was earlier to programmatic level accreditation. I mean, I think there is more responsiveness at that level and more knowledge of what is required in terms of employment in particular uh, fields. But um, not a good answer. But. Is anyone? Oh, I was, wondering. I was just going to say. I think this is. I think again. This is. This is sort of a. The political economy here is different, right? We our employers relate to one another diff in different ways, um, and there's there's a there's a high level of competition, a high level of sort of uh, emphasis on asset specific uh, skills, right? Um, and that that makes it harder uh, to to sort of c collaborate. I think there is a movement though to. Um, to develop certifications across, I know there's, I know there's, there's something going on in aerospace. There's a, a bunch of work in manufacturing uh, on this on this front. So it's not exactly the same as sort of. Uh, I don't I don't think it's the same as the employment qualification profile, but it's sim it's a similar effort. I would also say that uh, competency-based programs are working very closely with employers to create the competencies, but they're not widespread and scaled in the way you were alluding to. Great, and I think I'm, I've gotten the time the time signal. So I know there are lots of questions. I think we could talk about this forever, at least we all could. But I appreciate all of your questions and appreciate all of your thoughts. And um, thank you for, for your three words. We will remember them. And, uh, and now we'll have the next panel. Thank you, guys. Thanks.